As many as uh, you all know that whenever I'm leading service, um, there's a particular verse that I like to quote um, before I call Jody up, um, usually. Um, and, and I just kind of want to share with you before I get in the teaching tonight um, a, a few reasons why I like to quote that verse. Um, first of all, I believe it. Um, there have been things in my life that I've seen happen that in my eyes weren't a possibility. And I saw God be able to just work it out what seemed like that effortlessly. Um, so in man's eyes, sometimes things seem impossible, but God can, you know, through God, He, he can work those out. Um, the second reason um, that I like to say that is a lot of times um, the Bible references children uh, in many different different uh, verses. You know, some says he says, "Let the children come," or out of the mouth of babes, or he talks about milk versus solid food, making the child reference there as far as like a spiritual child uh, or faith like a child. So a child is mentioned uh, or made re reference to many times throughout the Scripture, and as we all know. Uh, one of the best ways to teach children is by repetition. You know, I have two kids, uh, seven and three. Um, neither of them have ever touched a hot stove, but they know not to do that because me and Charlotte have told them and told them and told them and told them that the stove is hot. Don't touch it. You'll get burned. They know that. They've heard it so much. They believe it. It's like second nature to them. And so that's another reason why I wanted to, to share that verse, is that the more times you hear it, the more, uh, the more likely it will be uh, to become second nature to you. That, you know, whenever, regardless of the situation you may find yourselves in in life, you can always remember that verse and know that, you know, it's not impossible with God. The third reason, and uh, I'll tell you a quick little story before I share this reason with you. Um, a few months ago, uh, Charlotte had some coupons that were going to expire. And um, she asked me, uh, she said, would you mind to run to Walmart for me? Because I, I've got three coupons that I really like to use. They're really good coupons on products that we use a lot. Um, but they're, go they're going to expire today. I said, sure, not a problem. So it's kind of eight, nine o'clock in the, in the evening. Um, so I went ahead and went to Walmart. I got the products and went through the checkout line just fine. Got the car, it's coming back home. And I got back to about 14th Street West and I realized that I did not use the coupons that she sent me out there. <laughs> so the third reason that I, I say that is because God allows me to remember it each time. And I think that's a small miracle in and of itself. Um, <laughs> and of course, that verse is Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Now you do know if you had to put them out the window and get mouse rush, you would be said that I didn't do it. She didn't see him, so I told on myself, which is something I need to learn not to do. But anyways, uh, we're going to go ahead and transition into the uh, teaching part of the service. Um, I'll try not to be too long, as I know there's a fine line between a long, drawn-out service and a hostage situation. Uh, could say something, but I'm not. Um, <coughs> but we're continuing the series on what it means to be a church member, uh, the different aspects of it and the importance of it. Uh, the first week we talked about being active in the church. Uh, last time we discussed unity in the church and how to encourage or to, bro to provoke each other and lift each other up through love. Well, tonight's topic uh, is about not letting our own preferences and desires be in the focus of the church. 
not letting our own preferences and desires be in the focus of the church. Now, uh, tonight's lesson will be presented a little bit differently than the other two have. Um, in the previous lessons, I interjected more um, from uh, you know, personal experiences and my, my own thoughts. Um, tonight's lesson, I'm going to be following a little more closely uh, to the reading of the book. Um, and again, that book is called uh, I Am a Church Member by Thomas Rayner. Um, so, anyone with kids or anyone who's ever been a kid, because that kind of covers everybody, so we're good, um, can understand the concept of because I want it my way, right now, without compromise. You know, it, it's good that we grow out of that as adults, right? Uh, I see some shaking heads. Uh, well, well, at least it, it's good that we grow out of that, you know, and never revert back, back to that phase when we become Christians, right? Uh, you know, sadly, uh, adults and Christians can sometimes act like those children who want things their way. And this is nothing new. Even Jesus' disciples had a tendency to fight with one another. On one occasion, the twelve even argued about who was going to be the greatest. Can you imagine that? The closest followers, followers of Jesus were having a me-first fight. And Jesus knew what they were talking and arguing about. Mark chapter 9, verse 35 Mark, 30, Mark chapter 9, verse 35 says, And he sat down, so he stopped what he was doing, and he sat, he sat down and called the twelve, and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and servant of all. Now so far in this series, there's definitely been a couple of reoccurring themes, and that's to love each other and to serve. As a church member, our motivation should not be to get our preferences to the top of the list. We're supposed to be last, not first. We're supposed to be servants instead of seeking to be served. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many times does something need to be in, mentioned in the Bible for us to consider it really important. Now I understand, I know that anything in the Bible is important. I get that. But you know, you read a chapter and think, wow, that was mentioned seven times. He must be really trying to focus on this. So I want you all to get a number in your head of how many times something would be mentioned in the, in the Bible to kind of fall in that category of being really important. Now according to an app on my phone, uh, and it's in the King James Version, uh, the word servant, or a similar variation, is mentioned 885 times in the Bible. Now sometimes it refers to a person who has that official role in the household, but many times it refers to the role that we are to assume as, as Christians. Now in the book he talked about a survey that was conducted of churches that were in, inwardly focused. For the most part, they were not serving past their own walls or their own members. In other words, these churches were largely self-serving. In the survey, they found ten behavior patterns of members in these churches. And I want us to, to see if we recognize any of those in our church. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I see all of these. You know, I, you know I've read through the list and maybe I saw some of them. Um, Oh, you know, um, but there might be some of the areas that we don't, you know, struggle with as a whole, but maybe individually uh, we, we may struggle with, and we may see that. That's why I wanted to kind of go over all, all ten of them. Um, you know, I thought about picking and choosing, but I thought, well, some of these, some people may, you know, may see either in their lives or in, you know, certain smaller aspects uh, of the whole. Um, now, I'll say this, that I don't necessarily agree with the way they're titled, um, but this is the way the, the, the book has them. Number one, 
is worship wars. One or more factions in the church want the music just the way they like it. Any deviation is met with anger and demands for change. The order of service must remain constant, which they wouldn't be happy tonight. Uh, certain instrumentation is required, while all others are prohibited. Basically, they have a narrow view and are not very open-minded. The second one is prolonged minutia meetings. The church spends an inordinate amount of time in different meetings. Most of the meetings deal with the most inconsequential items, while the Great Commission and Great Commandment are rarely the topics of discussion. Yeah. Number three is faculty focus. The church faculties develop iconic status. One of the highest priorities in the church is the protection and preservation of rooms, furniture, and other visible parts of the church building and grounds. Number four is program driven. Every church has programs, even if they don't want to admit it. When we start doing a ministry a certain way, it takes on procedural status. The problem, the problem is not with programs. The problem develops, develops when the program becomes an end instead of what, it, instead of a means to the greater ministry. And we've talked about that several times in our uh, discipleship class on Sunday mornings. Um, you know, basically, you know, it's a good class. What are we going to do when it's over? Thank you very much. I need that back up. <coughs> I can tell. <laughs> um, so we, we don't, you know, the, the class isn't a, an end. We don't just go through the class and say, okay, well, that was good. Now what? We have to take and apply what we've learned in that and move forward and try to disciple people and, and help them grow spiritually and help the church to grow as well. <coughs> Number five is inwardly focused budget. A, dispropor a disproportionate share of the budget is used to meet the needs and comforts of the members instead of reaching beyond the walls of the church. So what I'm getting from that is that we need to cut the air conditioning budget. <laughs> Which it kind of feels like that they've done that. <laughs> <laughs> Number six is inordinate demands for pastoral care. All church members deserve care and concern, especially in times of need and crisis. Problems develop, however, when church members have unreasonable expectation for even minor matters. Some members expect the pastoral staff to visit them regularly merely because they have membership status. Number seven is attitudes of entitlement. This issue could be a catch-all for many of the points already named. The overarching attitude is one of demanding and having a sense of deserving special treatment. Number eight is a greater concern about change rather than the gospel. Almost any noticeable changes in the church evoke the anger of many, but those same passions are not evident about participating in the work of the gospel to change lives. Basically, they say, I want an omelet, but I don't want to have to break any eggs to get it. Number nine is anger and hostility. <coughs> Members are constantly angry. They regularly express hostility towards church staff and other members. I can't tell you the number of times I've been beaten up in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and more than once by Levi. <laughs> Just kidding. Number 10 is evangelistic apathy. Very few members share their faith on a regular basis. More are concerned about their own needs rather than the greatest eternal needs of the world and the community in which they live. <coughs> in almost every behavior, church members were looking out for their own needs and 
preferences. I want the music my way. I want the building a certain way. I'm upset because the pastor didn't visit me. I want, I want to change, I don't want to change anything in my church. I, 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 I. You get the picture? Church membership, from a biblical perspective, however, is about servanthood. It's about giving. <coughs> it's about putting others first. Remember week one? Being active in the church. Isn't that an aspect of serving others? Who are we being active for? Week two, we discussed bringing unity. Serving and unity pretty much go hand in hand. Like I've mentioned, the two reoccurring themes so far in this series is love and serving others. We need to make our own attitude more in line with that of Jesus. So what is the biblical perspective? What example did Jesus teach? In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. You know, just a quick side note, it, it amazes me uh, some of the <coughs> people that don't have that misconception. Um, I had somebody uh, talk to me about um, when, um, where every, every knee should bow. He was talking about, uh, I hope to stand in front of the Lord and give an account and everything. And I was trying to explain to him, well, every knee will bow and kind of, you know, talk to him about that. He, he just wasn't understanding. Um, but in, in, this, in this passage, um, I really like uh, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You know, he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. He emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. He humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of a cross. Now these statements in Philippians 2 is not only a description of the obedience of Christ, it is an example for us to follow. We are to be servants. We are to be obedient. We are to put others first. We are to do whatever it takes to keep the unity in our church. And again, out of love, out of ser serving others. The book closes out the chapter with this statement. My Savior went to a cross for me. I can deal with any inconveniences and matters that just aren't, uh, that just aren't my preference or style. And, you know, that's the mindset that we need to have. It's not always about us. Sometimes we need to take a step back and look at the whole picture and not just our little corner. So that, that pretty much uh, concludes the, the teaching uh, for this uh, third, uh, third week of this series. Um, talking about we need to have the, the mindset of Christ. Uh, we need to have that focus. Um, he humbled himself uh, and he, he became a servant. 
You know, he could have, at, at times it mentioned the Bible, how he could have called thousands of angels to be at his side. He didn't do that. Um, and going back, I really like that verse, number, uh, verse 6. You know, he did not consider... He, he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. He could have used that so many times, but he chose, he willingly accepted being a human, and he took all the responsibilities that came with, with being a human. Uh, I normally call on Jody uh, to finish out, uh, to close out the service, um, but I'm going to go ahead and do that tonight. That's all right. And um, with that said, uh, I hope that everyone is enjoying uh, the series um, on membership and is learning something from it. Um, I kind of look forward um, to the end of the series uh, for more reasons than one. Um, but re really, uh, I'd like to see if anybody has a difference uh, of uh, opinion from you know how they started out their view, their definition of a church member. And then to see how they how they view it at the end of the series. Uh, I wonder if anybody, uh, if any of their feelings or thoughts have changed on that. Um, so I'm excited to see that. Uh, that'll be coming up here in a few weeks. Um, so if you didn't get the homework assignment for the first at the first uh, the, the first lap class, uh, it's to uh, write down or take a note of how you view membership, and then we'll kind of go over that uh, towards the end of the series. Um,